Hello everyone, my name is Amir Agha-Kuchak and in this lecture, I present fundamentals of hydrologic modeling. We will build a model from scratch together, step by step, and then in the second part of the lecture, we will work on parameter estimation and model calibration. Let's get started. First, who is this course for? Here we cover introductory material with a focus on modeling hydrologic processes. The assumption is that you are familiar with the hydrologic cycle. Here we focus on how to link different variables, different processes, and calculate runoff based on some input rainfall and temperature data. Here we build a model from scratch in an Excel spreadsheet so you can see how we link different variables together. First, some definitions. Lumped models describe the entire area as one single unit. We calculate runoff at the outlet and we won't be able to produce any spatial information within this single unit. A semi-distributed model is basically a bunch of lumped models connected together. Again, each sub-basin will be treated like a single unit. Outputs from different units can be linked together and routed toward downstream. A distributed model is typically a gridded model with regular or irregular grids, and in each grid, we calculate all the processes in our model. Obviously, distributed models are more complex, they require more data, and they only make sense if we have the required spatial information. From model structure viewpoint, we have broadly three types of models, physically based, conceptual, and empirical. Physically based models are based on governing equations such as conservation of mass, the momentum equation, and so forth. They typically require a lot of data and of course, numerical modeling. Empirical models, on the other hand, are very simple and based on empirical observations such as rainfall and river discharge data. There are many useful empirical models in the literature but they have some limitations. Often they are not transferable from one location to another. They cannot be used to describe changes in land use, land cover, or climate conditions. Also, we can't use them to really understand physical processes and interactions between different variables. Conceptual models describe the processes using simple mathematical functions, typically linear. They are much simpler than physically based models and more complex than empirical models. Many of our widely used hydrologic models are conceptual. In this lecture, we develop a lumped conceptual model. This is our model structure. We start with precipitation. We decompose it to rainfall and snow. We calculate snow melt and liquid water and other relevant variables like soil moisture and evapotranspiration to calculate runoff. This is the model that we will develop together. Again, we use an Excel spreadsheet, we start with some input data, and we develop the model step by step. Download this Excel spreadsheet from my website and follow all the steps with me. Here we have 10 years of data, one vector of temperature data, daily, temperature, each day we have one single value, and precipitation in millimeter. Here our input data are in gray columns, so our main inputs are temperature, precipitation, and observed discharge. We also have model parameters, and as we go through, I'll introduce model parameters. Again here, I assume that you already have some background in hydrology, so I do not focus on describing methods for evapotranspiration or soil moisture estimation. Instead, I focus how we link these processes. Of course, in each part, I will briefly introduce one single method for hydrologic modeling, but I do not cover fundamentals of hydrology. My main focus is on modeling. The first step in our model flowchart is decomposing precipitation to rainfall and snow because we want to make some simplifying assumptions. We want to assume that if precipitation falls in form of snow, we won't have 
infiltration or direct runoff. It means precipitation does not translate to runoff immediately. It comes down in form of snow and it remains there until it melts. It's a strong assumption. We know in reality it is not necessarily like that, but we have to make some simplifying assumption to model rainfall runoff processes. If rainfall occurs or precipitation in liquid form, we have to calculate infiltration and direct runoff. It means some of that rainfall will infiltrate and some of that will immediately turn into runoff. In our Excel spreadsheet, we have 10 years of precipitation, daily precipitation and temperature data. We have to make an assumption for decomposing precipitation to rainfall and snow. One very common assumption is if temperature is below or equal freezing level, we assume the entire precipitation falls in form of snow. And if temperature is above, then the entire precipitation falls in form of rainfall. This is a very strong assumption. We know in reality, you can have rainfall below freezing level or snow above freezing level, especially because sometimes there is a big difference between air temperature close to the surface and air temperature high in the atmosphere that dominates rain versus snow formation. We know it's a strong assumption, but it allows us to simply decompose precipitation into rainfall and snow. We call the freezing level our temperature threshold or TT. We assume temperature threshold to be zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. And we can revisit our assumption when we get to parameter estimation and calibration. In our Excel spreadsheet, the first seven days, temperature is below zero. So we assume the entire precipitation falls in form of snow and the next day's rainfall occurs. When snow occurs, we have to keep track of snow, calculate snow accumulation, and also snow melt. Here again, we make a relatively strong assumption. We assume if temperature remains below zero, there is no snow melt. And when temperature goes above our temperature threshold, freezing level, in this case, snow melt starts. This is a strong assumption, especially when we are close to freezing level. We know that in reality, even when temperature is below zero, snow melt occurs, but this simplifying assumption allows us to easily calculate snow melt. Here we use a model based on degree day factor. Snow melt is equal to degree day DD times temperature, that's daily temperature T minus our fixed temperature threshold. Temperature threshold in this case is zero Celsius. Degree day describes how much snow can melt per degree per day. For example, if degree day factor is five millimeter per degree per day, it means for every one degree deviation from freezing level, then five millimeter of snow will melt per day. In our Excel spreadsheet, temperature threshold here is zero and our degree day factor is three. How to estimate degree day factor? It can actually be measured, but if we don't have direct data, we can either look into other similar studies in the same area, published papers and reports, or simply make an assumption first, and then later we will learn how to revisit and evaluate our assumption. In our Excel spreadsheet, we also have an initial value for snow. It is 25. It means there is 25 millimeter of snow already on the ground before we start modeling. Again, to calculate snow, we have to keep track of a snow accumulation from day to day and also calculate snow melt when temperature exceeds zero. We need a two part equation like this. If temperature is below or equal temperature threshold, then simply snow at time t plus snow at the previous time step, t minus one. And if temperature is above snow from t minus one, the previous time step minus snow melt. dd times t minus temperature threshold describes snow melt and snow t minus one is the snow in the previous time step. 
in day one, snow in the previous time step is our initial value. There is 25 millimeter of snow already on the ground. That's our T minus one. If there is no snow on the ground, our initial value is zero for the first time step. And we go forward day by day and we calculate snow accumulation. The first seven days, temperature is below zero. It means we just add snow values. So we calculate snow accumulation. There is no snow melt. But day eight in the model, temperature exceeds the freezing level. It means we have rainfall plus snow melt. So we've switched to the second equation. We calculate snow from the previous time step minus snow melt. This is the equation that we need to use to calculate snow. We use an if function because we have a two part equation. In an if function, you have a statement here. This is your main step statement temperature above temperature threshold. If this is true, Excel will execute the first statement here. If false, it will execute the second. So if temperature is not above zero or temperature threshold, then we simply add snow values. So this part of the equation is the first part of our equation. If temperature is above zero, we have to calculate snow minus snow melt. But here we use a maximum function because we want to avoid negative values. Imagine there is five millimeter of snow on the ground and your degree day factor is 10 millimeters per degree per day and temperature is one degree above zero. So you have five millimeter of snow on the ground, but 10 millimeter of snow melt per degree per day. Then the second statement will be minus five, but minus five snow doesn't make sense. If there is five millimeter snow on the ground, maximum amount of snow melt can be five millimeter. So degree day factor is what can potentially melt but if there is enough snow on the ground. So this maximum function here makes sure that we don't end up with negative snow values. Let's do that together. Let's apply the same equation to all rows. Now we have snow values throughout the entire period. As you can see, in the first seven days, temperature is below zero and snow, snow only accumulates. Then when it goes above, snow decreases because we have snow melt. So far, we have used two parameters temperature threshold zero and degree day factor of three. And we have calculated snow. We can always plot snow and investigate the time series and make sure it makes sense. If you are in Northern hemisphere, in most parts of the world, snow occurs in winter. So you can look at your time series and make sure it's reasonable. In this case, snow looks reasonable. I have snow in winter and no snow in summer. We decompose precipitation to rainfall and snow based on temperature and we calculated snow melt. The next step is calculating liquid water. What is liquid water? Here we define liquid water as everything available in liquid form. Rainfall plus snow melt. To calculate liquid water, we have to make a simplifying assumption. Our assumption here is consistent with the way we calculated snow and snow melt. We assume if temperature is equal or below freezing level, liquid water is equal to zero. That means everything is frozen. 
And if temperature is above zero, then precipitation P, everything falls in form of rain plus snow melt, SM. This is a very strong assumption, but when we don't have detailed data, we have to make simplifying assumptions. Also, this simple assumption allows us to minimize the number of parameters we need for hydrologic modeling. We use another if function, because we have a two-part equation. Our statement is if T, temperature, is larger than temperature threshold, if true, the first statement will be executed, if false, then the second. So the alternative, the second one, is T below temperature threshold. In that case, there is no liquid water, so the statement is zero. And if T is above temperature threshold, D is precipitation. We assume it falls in form of rainfall plus snow melt. So snow melt here is degree day factor times T minus temperature threshold. Similar to what I mentioned earlier, again, snow melt depends on how much snow you have on the ground. If there is no snow on the ground, there won't be any snow melt. If there is five millimeter of snow on the ground and your snow melt based on your degree day factor is 10 millimeter, in practice, only five millimeter of snow can happen and no more than that. Because of that, we use a minimum function because we want to avoid unrealistic snow melt values. Also note that in our equations, we are fixing our parameters. Here, C9 is our temperature threshold, and the dollar signs means we have fixed them. It means as we apply the same equation to other rows in our Excel spreadsheet, this value does not change, but temperature changes from day to day. Let's apply this equation. In the first seven days, temperature values are below zero and there is no liquid water and as soon as temperature increases above the freezing threshold then you see liquid water in your excel spreadsheet we used very simple models to calculate snow melt and liquid water some snow models require more parameters require more data but here we are using one out of many models out there there are other alternatives and you can change the model structure if you want the next step is calculating soil moisture. For soil moisture, similar to snow melt, there are many different models out there. We use a simple water budget approach. Imagine the subsurface as a bucket. Liquid water is like input into this system. A fraction of liquid water contributes to soil moisture and a fraction of liquid water contributes to direct runoff. Here we also call it effective precipitation. In this presentation, we use direct runoff and effective precipitation interchangeably. And actual evapotranspiration is a loss from the system. We know that water evaporates from soil and so it loses moisture through this process. We have input and output. So the main input is liquid water. The main outgoing flow is actual evapotranspiration. We also assume that there is some amount of moisture already in the soil. Even during droughts uh, and dry conditions, there is always some moisture in soil. So that would be our initial value, SMI, or initial value of soil moisture. That's the amount of moisture already in the soil when you want to start modeling. So this is our general equation. It's very simple. Input plus initial value, input is liquid water, plus initial value of soil moisture, minus effective precipitation. Why? Because not, the, not all the liquid water infiltrates into subsurface. So liquid water minus effective precipitation 
is what contributes to soil moisture minus actual evapotranspiration, which is lost in the system. So to calculate soil moisture using this model, we need to first calculate effective precipitation and then actual evapotranspiration. There are other soil moisture models that you can use, but this is our choice of model in, in this lecture. Let's start with effective precipitation. There are different methods out there to calculate effective precipitation. Here is one. Soil moisture divided by field capacity, Fc, to the power of beta times precipitation plus snow melt. Let's define these terms. Let's assume that subsurface is like a bucket. See the right figure here. And in this bucket, the capacity, the maximum capacity is FC or field capacity. Field capacity des describes the maximum soil moisture storage in the watershed. So soil moisture can range from nothing to maximum of field capacity. So here, field capacity is the upper bound for soil moisture. The higher the soil moisture, the less room is for infiltration and more water or more liquid water contributes to direct runoff or effective precipitation. If you look at this equation more carefully, P plus snow melt is basically liquid water. And of course, we only have effective precipitation in this model when there is liquid water. Remember, we made a simplifying assumption. If temperature is below zero, there is no liquid water. And of course, based on this equation, no effective precipitation. So the second part is liquid water and we have already calculated it. The first part, we can call it runoff coefficient, similar to runoff coefficient in other empirical method. Here, the first term, soil moisture divided by field capacity, ranges from zero to one when soil moisture is zero, runoff coefficient is zero. When it is one, it means soil moisture is at its upper bound field capacity. So this term will be one. If this term is one, it means there is no more room for infiltration or soil moisture is at the upper bound. Soil is fully saturated, means the entire liquid water contributes to effective precipitation or direct runoff. But if this term, runoff coefficient, is less than zero, then always a fraction of liquid water contributes to soil moisture. You can see the units here. For now, all the variables are in unit length, precipitation, snow, liquid water, and also effective precipitation in our model in unit length. We can always multiply by area of the watershed to calculate volume of water. If we plot runoff coefficient, the first term, against soil moisture in the x-axis, we can investigate the role of this parameter beta. So the x-axis is soil moisture. And remember, it ranges from zero to field capacity. Field capacity is like the upper bound for our soil moisture. Soil moisture also has unit length here. So this runoff coefficient is typically less than one. And if we raise a value less than one to the power of a value larger than one, then it shrinks. So for beta equal to one, we end up with a linear line, like the blue dotted line here. And if we increase beta to two, three, or other variables, you see that this linear blue line turns into this red or green lines here and shows a nonlinear behavior. For a fixed amount of soil moisture, this vertical line, if we increase beta from one to two, runoff coefficient decreases. So if beta is equal to one, my runoff coefficient is 0 0.7. If beta increases to two, runoff coefficient drops to 0 0.5. And if it increases to three, runoff coefficient drops to 0 0.25.
Beta is simply like a knob. It does not have a unit and it doesn't have any physical meaning here. It simply is a knob that allows us to change the amount of effective precipitation. Let's say we start with beta equal to one and we notice that our model overestimates discharge. One option would be increasing beta so that we decrease runoff coefficient and runoff in our model. Later, we will talk about this in more details. But here is an important point. The reason we are calculating effective precipitation is because we need it to calculate soil moisture. But we also need soil moisture to calculate effective precipitation. Let's look at our equation again. Soil moisture is equal to initial value of soil moisture plus liquid water minus effective precipitation minus actual evapotranspiration. But in our equation to calculate effective precipitation, we need soil moisture too. Here, again, we have two variables that are linked together, in this case, through soil moisture, and we want to solve this problem. The way we approach this issue is using initial values or initial soil moisture. Again, we have to make an assumption. In our Excel spreadsheet, there is an initial value for soil moisture. The value is 100. Again, we are using unit length for everything, so we are assuming that in our subsurface there is equivalent of 100 millimeter of soil moisture. Later, we will revisit this assumption and we evaluate it. This is our equation. F32 is liquid water that you have already calculated. Soil moisture divided by field capacity. Field capacity again is a parameter. It's a physically based parameter that we can measure, but if you don't have any direct data, you need to make an assumption. Soil moisture, for soil moisture, we use the initial value 100 divided by field capacity to the power of beta. Again, for beta, we have to make an assumption times liquid water. Let's look at our Excel spreadsheet. Field capacity, our initial value is 190. And for beta, we have used 5. So effective precipitation is con edge. Our values won't make sense right now because we don't have soil moisture yet. When we calculate soil moisture, all these values will be updated. Back to our soil moisture equation, we calculated liquid water and effective precipitation. We assumed initial value of soil moisture. The next step is actual evapotranspiration. In our Excel spreadsheet, we already have long-term average monthly potential evapotranspiration and also long-term average temperature. These 12 values here are average temperatures and these 12 values are average potential evapotranspiration at monthly scale. Potential evapotranspiration is available from different data sets around the world. So if you don't have data, you can go to um, one of the existing data sets, for example, NOAA, NASA, and even some academic institutions have their own global potential evapotranspiration data that you can go extract data for your own basin. Long-term temperature, uh, long-term monthly temperature are also available from multiple data sets. The third column here is daily equivalent of potential evapotranspiration. Here, the temporal resolution of our model is daily. Every day we have temperature and precipitation. So for potential evapotranspiration, we need to use daily equivalent. Basically, each value in the second column divided by number of days in that month gives you the equivalent daily. So five millimeter per month in January 
means 5 divided by 31 days in January, you get the daily equivalent. The next value, again, 5 divided by 28 days in February, you get the daily equivalent for all days in February. So in this equation, potential evapotranspiration at monthly scale is available. It's an input variable. Long-term temperature at monthly scale, Tm, is also input in our Excel spreadsheet. And we want to adjust our potential evapotranspiration values for daily observations, daily temperature observations in our study area. Again, in this course, I assume you're familiar with fundamentals of hydrology and you know the difference between potential evapotranspiration and actual evapotranspiration. We don't go into details of PET or potential evapotranspiration calculations. If you're not familiar with potential evapotranspiration estimation, I encourage you to review introductory hydrology textbooks to learn about different methods to calculate PET. Here we assume you already have potential evapotranspiration and you want to calculate actual evapotranspiration. Very briefly, potential evapotranspiration is what can potentially evaporate it if there is enough water in the system and there is enough energy for evapotranspiration. Actual evapotranspiration is what actually happens. So in theory, based on solar radiation, temperature, and other variables, in your study area, the potential evapotranspiration could be 100 millimeter per month. But if there is not 100 millimeter, let's say there is only equivalent of 20 millimeter of water, only 20 millimeter can get evaporated. So that would be 20 millimeter would be actual evapotranspiration and 100 would be the potential or the theoretical evapotranspiration. Here we have potential evapotranspiration. First, we want to calculate adjusted potential evapotranspiration. That's PEA is adjusted potential evapotranspiration. What we calculate here is a still theoretical. It is still potential, but we make adjustments based on daily temperatures. Our assumption is that our long-term potential evapotranspiration is primarily based on long-term temperatures. It means this value of potential evapotranspiration is based on long-term temperatures. So you want to make adjustments. If one day is much warmer than average temperature in January, you may want to adjust your potential and increase it. And if it is colder, then you may want to adjust this long-term average and decrease it. So that's the point of adjustment here. So the adjustment is based on daily temperature difference, T daily temperature minus long-term monthly temperature. Long-term monthly temperature is the same for all values within each month. So all daily temperatures in January minus long-term January temperature. Potential evapotranspiration at monthly scale is again the same for all values within each month. C is another model parameter. We have to make an assumption about C and then later we will do parameter estimation and evaluate our assumption. So if temperature is larger than long-term temperature, this term will be positive so adjusted potential evapotranspiration will be larger than potential evapotranspiration. If daily temperature is below long-term mean, this term will be smaller than one. So adjusted potential evapotranspiration will be less than long-term potential evapotranspiration. After calculating adjusted potential, we need to calculate actual evapotranspiration. For actual evapotranspiration, we have to have a way to look into water availability. It means, is there enough water for evapotranspiration? If there is plenty of water for evapotranspiration, we assume that actual evapotranspiration is the same as potential evapotranspiration. But if there is not enough water in the system, then we need a model to estimate actual evapotranspiration. Here, we use another parameter, 
for water availability. We call it PWP or permanent wilting point. Permanent wilting point is a threshold. We simply assume that if soil moisture is below permanent wilting point, then we are water limited. It means there is not enough water for evapotranspiration uh, to meet the potential. So actual evapotranspiration when soil moisture is below permanent wilting point is equal to adjusted potential, what you calculated in the previous time step, times soil moisture divided by permanent wilting point. Use only this equation when soil moisture is below permanent wilting point. So this term, the second term in the equation, will be less than one. In that case, actual evapotranspiration will be less than adjusted potential. But if soil moisture is above permanent wilting point, we assume there is plenty of water in the system and actual evapotranspiration is the same as adjusted potential. Again, this is a strong simplifying assumption, but it allows us to calculate these variables with very few parameters. Here I am showing the equation graphically. The x-axis is soil moisture. Remember, it ranges from zero to field capacity. Field capacity is the upper bound for soil moisture. So permanent wilting point PWP should be less than field capacity. If soil moisture is above permanent wilting point, here in the y-axis, we are showing actual evapotranspiration divided by adjusted potential. So in the first equation, if soil moisture is above permanent wilting point, then actual evapotranspiration is the same as adjusted potential evapotranspiration. So the ratio will be one straight line. And if soil moisture is below this ratio, changes linearly in this equation. Let's calculate adjusted potential evapotranspiration in our Excel spreadsheet. One plus C13 is our new parameter. It's a parameter we need to calculate adjusted potential, parameter C times. Here we are using an index function. Review the syntax and learn how this function works. Here we have 12 values of monthly temperatures and also, and also monthly potential evapotranspiration. Remember for all January month, we have the same average temperature. So we need to calculate daily temperature of January 1st minus monthly average of January minus 1.4. Then the second day, again, minus the same value. And third day, again, minus the same value. The index function allows us to do that very simply and efficiently. So first we calculate month ID. So month function in Excel gives you the month ID, month ID one, two, three. So all Januarys in all 10 years will get the same month ID of one. All February months get month ID of two. Then the index function tells Excel spreadsheet to subtract the right monthly temperature as you go through your time series. The same applies to potential evapotranspiration. Here we use the daily equivalent, remember, monthly potential divided by the number of days in that particular month because our time step is daily we select our 12 potential evapotranspiration values and the index is based on month id here are our potential evapotranspiration values and the index is based on column b or month id if we look at our excel spreadsheet we are using this new parameter, C, 0.03, and these are our daily potential evapotranspiration values and monthly temperature values. The month ID is simply calculated using month function in Excel. And if you click on the equation, you can see that we are using these monthly values of temperatures and potential evapotranspiration. 
and month ID. If you go to day two, now you're using second day temperature, but these values remain the same. And Excel knows that as long as the month ID is one, it has to use the first temperature value here and the first evapotranspiration. When you go to month two, it goes to the second temperature value and second evapotranspiration. In our soil moisture equation, we need actual evapotranspiration and not adjusted potential. We need to update adjusted potential based on soil moisture and PWP. Here is the equation. Again, another if function, if soil moisture G31 is larger or equal to PWP F13, then the first statement, actual evapotranspiration is the same as adjusted potential, what we calculated in the previous time step. If not, we will calculate actual evapotranspiration using this equation here. Let's do this now. Please try to follow step by step. Our values don't make sense yet because we don't have soil moisture. Remember, we are calculating actual evapotranspiration for soil moisture estimation, but like in the previous step, we need soil moisture to calculate actual evapotranspiration. For the first time step, we use initial value of soil moisture. For the second day and more, we don't have soil moisture yet, so our values for now don't make any sense. But they get updated. So back to our soil moisture equation. Initial value of soil moisture is given. We assumed 100. Liquid water, we have already calculated it. Also, effective precipitation and actual evapotranspiration are now in our Excel spreadsheet. Now we can move on to calculating soil moisture. Here is the equation. Back to soil moisture. As you can see here, these are the variables we are using. They are highlighted here. for all the columns and let's do this also for the entire length of record now we have updated soil moisture direct runoff or effective precipitation and actual evapotranspiration so back to our model structure now the next step is to calculate runoff here we use a bucket model concept. It is widely used in conceptual hydrologic modeling. Depending on your study area and data you have, you may go with one bucket or two buckets or even more. Here we go with two buckets describing near surface and subsurface processes. We want to simulate surface flow, interflow, and base flow contributions to the overall runoff. Again, for definitions of these terms, uh, review hydrology textbooks. In this lecture, we focus on modeling these processes. Here are the equations we use for estimating outflows from uh, these two buckets. Here we have four discharge values. One connects the two together, that's Q percolation, and the other three contribute to overall runoff. The equations are linear. Each one has a parameter K. It's called storage constant or reservoir constant. It has a unit of inverse time. Outflow is a function of S or storage. If there is no storage, there is no water basically, we assume there is no contribution to runoff. But if there is water, some of that contributes to overall runoff. Here, uppercase Q represents volume K times S times A. A is area of the watershed. If we remove A, then 
we will calculate Q in unit length. That's what we do in our Excel spreadsheet because so far we have used the unit length. We calculate lowercase Q uh, or Q in length unit. And then later toward the end, we multiply by area to calculate volume. Q naught or the first outflow is a bit different than the other ones. Q1, Q percolation, and Q2 are simply K parameter times S storage of that bucket. Q1 and Q percolation are a function of S1 or storage of the upper reservoir and Q2 outflow is a function of SB or storage of the second reservoir or base flow reservoir. The first one, the outflow is at the very top. It is designed to describe fast and immediate contribution to runoff. First, we need a threshold L. We assume that if a storage is below L, there is no outflow from the top of the bucket. It means there is some room uh, for storage and water remains in the basin for a while until it reaches a threshold and then it starts contributing to runoff. If storage is above L, then again we have a similar equation. The difference is S or storage level in the upper reservoir or upper bucket minus our threshold L times K naught. So we need to add new parameters to calculate storage and later runoff. Here are the parameters we use in our Excel spreadsheet. K naught for Q naught. K1 corresponds to the bottom outflow from the upper bucket. L is storage threshold. K2 is for Q2 and K percolation represents the connection between the two buckets. Where do we get these parameters? Again, we make an assumption and then later we estimate these parameters and double check our assumptions. Since outflows are functions of S values, we need to calculate storage S1 for the first reservoir and S2 for the bottom reservoir. Our general equation is like this. Storage of the upper one is equal to initial value of storage. We always assume there is some initial storage plus inflow to the system minus the three outflows, minus Q0, minus Q1, minus Q percolation. Initial value in our Excel spreadsheet is two millimeter and Q surface is what you have calculated before as direct runoff or effective precipitation. In our Excel spreadsheet, we use unit length, so storage in length and Q also in length. So for now, we don't multiply by area. We will take care of area at the very end. So this is our equation, initial value of storage plus effective precipitation or direct runoff minus first a Q naught minus Q1 minus Q2. These two equations are very simple, S times K. For S, we are calculating S1, but we also need storage to calculate these two terms. So we use the initial value of storage. For the first one, again, it's a two-part equation. If storage is less than L, then there is no storage. Then there is no outflow, there is no Q0. So use the maximum of zero and this term, S minus L times K naught. Let's do that in our Excel spreadsheet. Again, the initial value is something you assume, but later we will revisit our assumptions. Here is S1, this is what we just calculated. You can see that in the Excel spreadsheet. It appears in one of the tabs. What we have calculated is a storage in millimeter, so unit length. You can see it's a highly variable time series because we are looking at a relatively shallow depth of soil. So it's near surface and there is high variability. Let's assume that in our equation, L length is 10. So I'm drawing this horizontal red line as my threshold. Let's assume this is what we use to calculate S values. If I'm here on the x-axis, it means there is no storage. 
So no Q0, Q0 will be zero, Q10. If I'm looking at the value between zero and the red line, so here, for example, S equal to five, again, Q0 will be zero because five is below my red threshold, so Q0 will be zero, but I have non-zero Q1 and Q percolation. If S is larger than the threshold, then all three values will be non-zero and they all contribute to the overall runoff. K percolation, of course, indirectly through the second reservoir. Now let's look at the second reservoir or the second bucket. Here we have one inflow, and that's Q percolation, and one outflow, Q2. Again, we assume an initial value. So S2 is equal to Q initial minus Q2 plus Q percolation. Again, we are calculating S in unit length. So for now, we do not multiply by area. Initial value of S2, L31, plus S1 times K percolation, minus S2 times K2. Here, the initial value of S2 is 200. As you can see, we use larger value for S2 relative to S1 because here, we are using the first bucket for near surface shallow processes and S2 is groundwater base flow contribution to runoff. Now we have S1 and S2. Let's look at S1 and S2 together. There is a big difference between these two. As you can see, S1 is highly variable, S2 is less variable, changes slowly. We use very different initial values. The second one changes really slowly because you can imagine groundwater responds really slowly to changes in precipitation. To do that, we have to make sure our parameters are reasonable. We do that through K values. K has inverse time unit. So to make sure we get something like this, K0 should be larger than K1, K1 larger than K2. Back to our model structure, we calculated the outflows from our bucket models, and now we are ready to calculate runoff. Here we assume runoff is simply Q0 plus Q1 plus Q2, the three outflows from our bucket models. Here is the equation for Q0 plus Q1 plus Q2. Again, K times S for Q1 and Q2. For the first one, we use a maximum function, S1 minus L. If this term is negative, then there is no Q0, there is no contribution from Q0. The output is still in unit length, as you can see here, so it's millimeter per day. Now that we have calculated the overall Q, now we can multiply by area and calculate the volume of flow, like meter cube per second. This is how we convert um, from millimeter per day to meter cube per second. We multiply by area and we do unit change so that we calculate discharge in meter cube per second. We just calculated runoff, and we also have some real observations from our study area, the gray column here next to our simulated runoff, called it Q observations. These are real observations. We're going to evaluate our model against observations and revisit our parameters and initial values. The Excel spreadsheet gives you uh, simulations and observations next to each other. As you can see, the two are pretty consistent because I used very reasonable parameters. In reality, when you do this for the first time, the simulations and observations may not look similar but there are ways to adjust and calibrate your model. If we zoom into this part of the graph, you can see that 
the peaks are simulated reasonably well, but there are biases in low flows. You can see that simulations in low flows are systematically higher than observations. If your objective is simulating peak flows, this is probably already good enough. But if you also care about low flows and you want to make sure they are reasonable, we have to go back and adjust our model parameters. In our Excel spreadsheet, there are some metrics there that we will use to evaluate our model and later estimate our parameters. So far, we have calculated runoff. And in the next lecture, we will talk about model parameters, how to check the assumptions we made, update parameters, and optimize our model to make sure simulations are consistent with observations. The details of the model I presented are available in this paper, including the equations, and you can find some additional references to the original um, publications on this model. Now continue to the second part so that we can update our model parameters. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or add your questions in the comments. I will try to respond to all of them.